Good, How are you? good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Thank good. you. Good. Um, so I wanted to start off asking you about, um, so, okay, I've been doing a lot of research in the last week. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I saw that um, in my research that you were six years old when your dad gave you your first guitar, right? Wow, that's true, but I don't know where you found this info. It's totally true. On YouTube. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and yeah, I was true. just, wa I wanted to ask if you can talk about, if you remember what it felt like um, when you first started learning to play music and was first holding that guitar and working around it and everything. I absolutely remember. The first time I got to hold my own guitar, I just wanted to do the, um, you know how with guitar you have two hands and the right hand do, does the strumming and the left hand does the notes. Well, I just, I just cared about the right hand. I just wanted to do, if I remember, it was like an Elvis Presley rhythm that I wanted to do. And um, I was so excited. I was like, I don't think the sound was really, I mean, the sound I was emitting were really good, but I, I was really excited. That's so awesome. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. And I wanted to ask you about meeting Naaman when you were 11 and what that felt like, if you could talk about when you guys first started making music together. Yeah, well, in my school, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of art kids or musician kids at all. It was more like a sports kind of school. Uh, there was a rugby team and I was, I, I might say at the age of 11, I was the only musician that I, at least that I had met, you know, I mean, that I knew. So I just placed an ad. Um, I stuck it, it was like a flyer that I stuck on the wall at the school saying that I wanted to uh, to start a band with people and um, no one answered. So I ended up like recruiting people that I just thought could maybe like music because the, it wasn't a big thing in my school. So I remember Neiman was wearing a Pixis t-shirt and uh, I was like, do you, do you want to play in a band? But he didn't play any instrument, but he said, okay. So I had to teach him uh, to play drums. That's great. <laughs> I, lo I love it. Um, and then, okay, this is kind of a nerdy question, but I'm just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask, did you ever have like a classic rock phase when you were a teenager? Um, I'm not sure what the, the word entails. Is it like, because I still have a classic rock face. I mean, I love B.B. King or Chuck Berry or, you know, it's my culture. So if that's classic rock, but I think there's another one like Bon Jovi kind of thing. I, uh, I guess in Ohio, like when I was a teenager in high school, the classic rock phase was like, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, The Doors, you know. The right, thing. right. I love The Doors. I've always loved The Doors since I was a kid. I've never had a Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin face. I'm not a big, uh, weirdly, because I play guitar, I'm not a big, like, guitar solo uh, or, you know, like, this big, like, hard rock uh, influence music. I'm not, I don't like it that much. Cool, cool. So, okay, I want to ask you about the aspects of the music world that you, like, like, dislike, and are kind of meh on, because there's a lot that goes into it between, you know, touring, promo, merch, you know, recording, releasing, live performance, um, finance aspect. So if you could like give a little map of like, you know, like, dislike, kind of like meh. Well, granted, I'm a musician because that's what I've always wanted to do. So I like that a lot. I like being a musician. That's the only thing that I can think of doing. So, but then within the the realm of doing what I want to do and what I love to do, there are things I like or dislike. Um, I don't know. It's hard sometimes to play shows and um, not make enough money to pay the musicians you're touring with. Or so that's, that's kind of shitty. That sucks sometimes. Or, you know, just, I guess what I learned along the way that I don't like to start with the negative is that, um, if you're in the moment of what people like, everyone around you in the industry uh, will act like if your music was great. 
which is a, which, ha which happened to me at some point, but it was at the start of my career. So I thought people really liked my music. And then uh, when the trend shifts and uh, it's time for electronic music or something, and the same people tell you that uh, uh, rock and roll is obsolete and uh, you should use synth or whatever, it's really disappointing because then, you know, uh, it's kind of cliche to say it, but uh, for most people working in music, it's just another product, another way to make money. So there's no, you know, and when you're a musician, you feel so strongly about it that, you know, music is so uh, really important for me um, that, uh, you know, when people are like, I love what you do, I totally believe them. And then if, they're, uh, if they end up like saying that I should do something more like, uh, something that I think is stupid or really bad, you know, I'm just like, uh, this world of mu music doesn't make sense. But, uh, you know, overall, what's positive about it is that there are people who love playing music and who are good musicians, and you end up meeting them and working with them, and that makes the whole thing worth it. And also, I don't know, it's endless, I guess, that's very positive. Like, you know, after every album, I'm like, how am I going to write another song? Like I've said everything, I've played everything, but I always find there's always something that I want to say or play, you know, and that's very, it's always surprising because, you know, songs are very simple. It's not like, I don't know, it's not like there's an endless supply of chords or, you know, even like feelings that you want to express in songs. You don't want to make a song about, um, or you could, I guess, but uh, a washing machine or something. It's always like, you know, the, sort of the same topics and uh, uh, the same chords, but um, you always find a new song. It's amazing. Let's make a song about a washing machine. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. washing and I even machine. think that I've used it in a song. So as I was saying it, I think <laughs> I might have used laundry or something. <laughs> <laughs> I like to make songs that are like stupid or just silly. Like, that's fun. Do you write songs? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and so far, the the response I get is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not good, <laughs> but I like to do it, you know. And I want to, you know, get better, of course. And you know, hopefully, I'll put out something good, you know, Jeff Lewis <laughs> style. <laughs> work to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I was saying. You know, don't trust what people say that much because especially nowadays I feel uh, it's so uh, encrusted in the notion of success like what right. people think of music so if something's successful it's necessarily good and so if you're like yourself just starting out people don't even have I feel like the the open-mindedness to think that it could be a good song if it's right. not approved by some kind of commercial success. So right. it's really, it can be frustrating, but uh, I think that if you write songs, just you really have to commit to write a good song. That's the, and even when you say, you know, a silly song or just commit to, to make it good, even if it's uh, the intent is silly, you know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm finally at the point where I'm just like, you know, regardless of what anyone thinks, this is something that for me is I'm pushing myself to, you know, do the best I can at something I care about. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And, you know, I, I've, I love Jeffrey. I know you love Jeffrey too. And yeah. just thinking about like how great of a songwriter he is and like how little recognition he gets is one of, I think, you know, it's like what you're talking about in terms of what's good versus what, is popular or gets attention. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to, it's as an artist, it's hard to navigate those notions just because it seems, almost seems like it's, uh, it's in your mind, you know, you're just like, but I know this is not that good. Like why, like last week I was reading the list of the 25 songs that matter now in the New York Times. You know, it's not like, uh, it's not supposed to be, um, a paper of the music industry, you know what I mean? They're supposed to have opinions and at least like uh, promote uh, literature sometimes. But the list was just the 25 uh, songs that earned the most money last year. It was totally stupid to read and uh, infuriating. 
Right. You're like, you know, what if, remember a few years ago when that song like uh, Gangnam Style was like uh, sold millions or whatever, or did YouTube hits? And pe so suddenly people are going to think that that's a good song. You know what I mean? Like just, it doesn't make any sense to me, but uh, right. you just have to, to accept that someone would be like, uh, well, Ed Sheeran is better than you because he sells more records and you just have to be like, well, I'm not sure about that, but uh, say what you want, you know? Right, right, absolutely. Um, I want to keep going with, I'm very professional as you can see. That's that good, question. good. How many interviews <laughs> have you done on this uh, device? This is literally my first, but not my last. Okay. That's good. You're doing a better job than uh, most professionals have had. Oh, no way. <laughs> I, I think it's probably because, like, legit, I don't know. I'll tell you, I've, as I've already mentioned, but for anyone who's going to watch this, like, I've been following you since I was about 18 or 19 or so. So um, I just, I don't know. I, I think that that has something to do maybe with, like, I really care, you know? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's lacking most times. I don't know why, like most people who work in uh, music journalism forget the name journalism. You know, most of the time they just, they don't take it seriously. I think it's because it's not really a, a vocation for most people. So they just, they want to be musicians and they end up being like critics or whatever. So they just, they don't investigate or, you know, research anything. They just like take your press kit and ask you the questions that, already on there you know right right yeah no and like i i really want to you know use this tool i want to you know do it more and just um use it as a way to like get to know artists better and also like have other people have the opportunity to get to know artists better because i love getting to know the artist it sounds redundant but you know it's like simple i guess mm -hmm. yeah it's good i mean that's your thing it's good sometimes it's dangerous to meet an artist you like because it's really hard to uh, separate the impression you've had from the work afterwards like it, it happened to me to meet people that i love the work of and they were kind of snobby or they were being assholes or you know what i mean and then afterwards i'm i just can't hear the music the same way and um super real i don't know if you've I don't know if you've like watched the Michael Jackson documentary of recent, but um, you know, no. it's the debate around like separating art from artists and just the reality of, of the tension that is sort of natural there sometimes is. Well, I think real. it's a good debate. It's a good debate in a way that uh, once you know, you can't separate, it's impossible. But if you take a step back, and think of all the art that you love and how little you know about who made it. You know what I mean? I don't know, you know, I, obviously it's a new situation nowadays where we know everything about everyone. So it's hard to have a, you know, like a, a well thought opinion about it. But my inclination is that if I love a painting in a museum by someone uh, in Holland in the 14th century. I don't know anything about that person. And why should it be different uh, nowadays, you know? That's kind of what I think. But it's, I mean, you can't ignore, like if you learn that uh, your favorite love song was written about, uh, you know, some person that was kept in a cave by another guy, you know what I mean? Like, or, you know, you can't listen to the song anymore, so. You know what I mean? It's just, it's really hard to to separate. That's why I said, I guess, in a lighter way that it's hard to meet the artists you like just because if they're, they don't have to be criminals, but just if they're like a little, you know, someone is like, is mean to a waiter or something like at a restaurant or, you know, or they're, they're acting like assholes, or you hear them, you overhear them being like mean to their wife or whatever, and uh, then you don't like the music anymore. So it's, sometimes it's better not to know. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, okay, I would like to ask you about uh, your approach to music, 
writing in general, your philosophy um, around music, if there, if you have one that you'd like to share. I know personally, I really enjoy, and I think you might agree with like Jad Fair, uh, his like approach to it. And if you want to like speak on that or just tell me your approach or, you know. Yeah, I met Jad Fair. It was really funny. Uh, it was cool. I don't know what I, it's hard because it's my life. So it's not even a philosophy. It's what I do. I just play music and write songs. That's what I do. That's, it's my life. I, I do it. And I think it's a good art. I love the art. I respect it. I give it the time and the effort to, to go beyond uh, what just comes to me, you know, to, to work on it and, and refine it and do, I'm like, you know, if I took, if I went through all the trouble, all the joys and the, um, the failures of being a musician, I can at least do the job well. That's kind of what, what I think about it. I, I don't really see a point. Maybe I, I understand, maybe I was a little bit like this as a teenager, kind of punkish, like being like, oh, I don't care about this, you know, like this kind of attitude to it. And I, I understand, but uh, I would be lying if I said that I just do it like some, as a light thing. I really love it, so I take the time. I'm right. on my piano right now. That's where I write these days. You're your piano right now? Yeah. yeah it's the best oh, light yeah. in the house. Uh, I was... Say what? So that's where I try to write. You try to write at the piano? Oh. Yeah, I've been, I've been writing on the piano this past, this past month. Did I you think my new album is going to be a piano album. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's so cool. I, I'm like, I love that you're sitting at the piano right now. Um, so what are some of your favorite among your past albums that you put out and why? Um, it's really weird with your own work is that it matters so much as you're doing it. Every, every breath of air, every... But you don't really listen back that much. It, it's very weird. It's like that. That might be the weirdest thing about uh, the job I do. It's just like how much effort and care you put into your work, and how little it is for you in the end. You know, because I have a visual part of my work too. I do painting and stuff, and that's I love like looking at the stuff I make. Like you know, I do it for my almost as much for my pleasure as I do it for um, for to put it out there but with music well I guess the songs I sing and I enjoy singing live you know so I make myself it's like making yourself a new toy or something that uh, you can take and play new games with but the albums it's hard to I don't listen back that much but when I if I had to think back I think that um, I really love that album not on top that was a uh, it was a long time ago but it's the first one that i considered myself as a producer for i was like i want to do it in mono i want to do this kind of sound and uh, and i had like strong opinions about about everything you know i, I picked the songs to be at the time i remember um, i loved uh the Marvelettes and the early Motown stuff. And I wanted everything to be like compact and songs to be like two, two minute and a half. And, uh, and, um, and the sound to be like strong into it. I wanted it to be easy to play on any kind of player, let's say mm -hmm. uh, transistor radio or, so I thought about all, all these things. And um, I think uh, it's one of the first time that I got what I was going for totally as an album. So I was really happy. I I love that album. That's one of my favorites as well. Oh, and cool. When I when I turned twenty seven, that I would listen to it and like it hit me in such a different way than when I was twenty two. Like, cause you say like, um, I never thought I would be. It's you know, it's ten years from teenage, and that's a freaking lot. I mm -hmm. never thought I'd be watching my little sister, you know, look be looking for a job. Um, that those lines in the song, um, they just they hit me so hard every time. Uh, I was just listening to it this morning and yeah, I want to thank you for putting the time in. Thank you. Yeah. Songs do that to you. Well, when I was 22, because you were referring to, um, 
to when you were 22. When I was 22, I wrote a song called uh, We'll Die 21. So, you know, it's like different, different uh, um, mind spaces, I guess. But not on top. Yeah, I remember that. And then, uh, I don't know, I like my, my two latest ones because, again, I guess the ones I like is the one that I totally um, crafted. You know, like Not On Top or and Switch Thursday and Santa Cruz Gold, my two latest ones. I recorded in my studio, you know, and again, you know, when you, I don't know if it does it to the listener, but for me, when I did it, when I sort of produced it, it's a great memory. And uh, sometimes when I haven't, I just have regrets about this or that, you know, that uh I guess I'm saying that I just think I'm better than, than everyone. I don't know. It's kind of weird. But uh, uh, <laughs> well, I think that uh, I like the, the one. No, maybe it's just because I see the whole thing as a, as a piece of art. And so when I do everything, it, it makes more sense to me, you know, with the cover or, you know, instead of a collaboration with a, with a sound engineer or a producer, or, you know what I mean? And um, since we're all, since we're talking about not on top, I'm gonna skip to one of my questions that was actually for near the end. I was gonna ask. So I noticed Switzerland Heritage and Not on Top are not on Spotify. So what's the deal, dude? Well, I don't know. It's like so complicated. My career has. I don't. I don't know anyone who's had like the same meanders of uh, labels and. I don't think I have more than two consecutive albums on the same label. And uh, Not On Top was on a label in England called Track and Field Records that just like closed shop. So I don't even know. And at the time, I didn't have a computer. So the like for the art, I just sent the art that I made by hand by, you know, by snail mail to the label. So they probably have it somewhere in their offices or so there's like all these things that so it's a matter of some labels just don't even exist. So I can't even ask them to, to put it out there. And, um, and some, I don't know. And I think also there's some, so which ones did you say? Switzerland Heritage? And not that, on top. That's odd. I don't know why, because Switzerland Heritage is on a, I don't know, it must be a distribution thing. I don't know. Hmm. It's like the one thing that uh, I didn't do, uh, as good of a, one thing that I'm not really uh, satisfied with is just that uh, I never, you know, like you were talking about Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lewis, he, he's been on rough trade his whole life. So his whole work is like at this one place that, uh, uh, that can put it out there or not, or do this or that, or, you know, the Silver Jews have everything on Drag City Records. So it makes sense. You can go get the, get it. But, uh, I don't think I have more than two albums on the same label. I don't even know. I don't have the contacts anymore. I don't, I don't even know what happened with them. Okay, but the songs, dear God, you've got those and like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just did, uh, you know, the recordings. In the middle of last year, I was trying to put a video on YouTube and I got, uh, you know, like a a warning that I was infringing some copyright about it. You know, it was my own song. It's just that some labels still own, I don't know how it works, but it's like the, you know, the, the computer recognizes the song from just like, you know, uh, from, from the digital content or something. And it belongs to a label in distribution or something. And you can't wow. really put it, I don't know. I don't exactly know how it works, but I know you have to go through a distributor to put your songs out there. Right. And so I imagine that that whole aspect of music, I mean, I can't imagine that being anyone's favorite when you're in the music industry, keeping track of, you know, like ownership and rights and all of that stuff. Yeah, it's annoying. It's annoying. Well, it's a bargain, I guess, with uh, nowadays, you know, uh, all of my income comes from publishing rights. And you know? so, you know, it's a bargain having... I guess if I was doing everything myself, keeping track of royalties, I would be able to like put all my songs out there and do all these things. But at the same time, I don't think I would have the, 
the capacity to know where where it's playing, if it's been on a movie, or to you know, it's just like all these things to keep track of that uh, I don't know how to do. So I, I've always had a publisher. Right, right, right. So I want to ask you about um, your great influencers. I gather that you uh, have been influenced by Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, John Peel, George Harrison. Do you want to just like talk a little bit about um, your big influencers? Influencers? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bob Dylan, to name one, is uh, what I love about him is that it's an endless spring to to get inspiration from it's just like so each song of his are so intricate and complicated and uh at the same time very easy to understand it's like everything is like perfect in its craft in his in his work so it's really interesting and there's so many songs too um so he's like the song material like it doesn't matter the sound of it or whatever it's just bob dylan is this, it's the craft of the song that i even though I love the sound of his albums, I get so much from just the craft of writing that he has. And then I love the Beatles. I've always loved the Beatles. And that's more like a, a whole other dimension of, uh, I don't know, it's like Game of Thrones or something. It's like so <laughs> many aspects of the Beatles. You have to, it's emotional. It's the sound. It's the lyrics. It's the, the weird dreams that you had because of it. It's like the intricacies of their relationship everything is like uh amazing with the beatles i love chuck berry i've always loved him he's perfect songwriter and musician in voice i just like he's my favorite i mm -hmm. love lucinda williams she's a wonderful uh, songwriter and voice she's one of my mm -hmm. models and heroes i love the silver jews david yes. bowen he's is an inspiration because his craft is uh, is one of a kind, and I really respect that. Uh, that he's just a writer who cares so much about uh, little details of writing and poetry that I don't think a lot of people put that much effort in their lyrics as he does, and that's a good um, good guide for me. Um, who else? You know, as I was saying, I'm a I love songs, so sometimes it's not like someone's whole career, but it's the, the songs of early Motown, the songs of Stax, the songs of, you know, uh, everything that uh, Phil Spector produced, or mm -hmm. all these songs, these pop songs are a big influence on me, and um, the voices and the music. I don't know, Lead Belly is one of my favorite, and I listen to him all the time. I don't know if you like his music, but uh, he's like the almost the origin of most of the things I like. Uh, I love Van Morrison, Lam um, so many. Th thanks for commenting on that. Um, so I want to ask about what are, what have some of your favorite collaborations been throughout your career, people that you've been able to record or tour with, et cetera? Well, I've done a lot. I think, I loved, at some point I was touring with, uh, my best memories are of touring. And uh, I remember a, a tour in early 2004 I did with Akimi Dawson. That was really fun. And I learned a lot from that tour. And I loved touring with Jolly Holland. She's a singer. I really admire a blues singer. I learned a lot from watching her perform. Those are two of my favorite tours. And in terms of collaboration, um, it's hard to say. I, I love playing with my friend, Tony Cody, and uh, recording with him. We've toured together. It's, yeah. I love that stuff too that you guys have done. Um, All right, cool. And okay, so here's a, here's a question that was submitted to me by a friend of mine named Nicole Parkinson. Uh, shout out to Nicole for being a cool. Hey, Nicole. Huh? Hey, Nicole. Hey, Nicole. Yeah. Um, so he was asking uh, for you to talk about the sidewalk cafe closing and what your favorite, um, uh, uh, most notable performances were that you got to see there. If you could talk about sidewalk a little bit. 
Ja, the Sidewalk Cafe, um, it closed and then Turner said that it was going to reopen it under another name or something like the Anti-Flu Cafe. Or, so I don't know if it's really closed, but I, I know, I haven't even seen it change. I know it they changed like the interior, the chairs and when uh, what I remember of the Sidewalk Cafe, it looked like a uh, the club in the Seinfeld series, you know, it had a red curtain and uh, black tables. It looked like a comedy club to me. Well, it was kind of nice. I saw good shows. I performed. Um, I remember performing with Turner Cody. I was on the ukulele, and um, I, I remember this show for some reason. I guess we we got really excited and played long songs. Or uh, I saw. Um, it was good stuff. I, I don't, I don't know if you know American Animan, but uh, he's a performer at the sidewalk. And recently, about the closing, he said that uh, it's not the place that makes musicians cool; it's the musicians that make uh, the place cool. And that's what I, I, I never thought the place was that cool, except that it was in the Lower East Side. It was kind of a, you had like a minimum drinks to get. It was super expensive and. Uh, there was like this whole higher, you know, hierarchy of uh, who was going to play at what time, and you had to be in with the uh, the guy who uh, who ran the open mic, or otherwise you were going to play at four in the morning. There was this whole like power thing. I think mm -hmm. scenes have never been very good to me. I always find like this. Uh, I don't know. It's like people. People regroup to feel stronger, but at the same time, it's kind of a uh, clicky by, by lack of having their own thing going on, you know. And uh, so, if you, I've always felt an outsider, I gotta say. And at the sidewalk, first, I'm not from New York, and uh, well, not everyone who played at the sidewalk was from New York, but I never felt that, even though, you know, my friends were Turner and Jeff and. It was in my, my scene, definitely. Totally. Thank you for commenting on that. Yeah. Um, I definitely vibe with uh, feeling like outside of a scene that even though you are really, you know, entrenched with the main part of it, like the, the artist, et cetera, um, there's just, there's always a lot that goes into a scene. And sometimes it can be awkward when you're really invested in like someone... Yeah feeling was that uh, it was, I don't know, it's like the people who did the least who were the most involved in being like a label anti-folk or something, you know, like people who had their songs going on and uh, who were involved in their own music, they didn't have time to be like uh, the the spearheads for, for a scene, you know, and uh, let alone when anyone had, you know, the minute Adam Green uh, got a little recognition, you wouldn't see him at the sidewalk anymore. You know what I mean? It's just, it's not a thing that, uh, I think it's something that makes people feel better to have a scene when when they don't have anything else going on or something, because at least there's their friends to, to clap for them or something. Right, 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 right. So, okay, I have a bunch of, I have some questions on lyrics from songs of yours. And cool. uh, it's a little game-like actually some of it so but my first question is about this lyric um i try to focus on what's here and not know what the world wants me to know um sound familiar <laughs> it does but i think it, this one was written by my brother at the time who was in the band or i okay. think so what song is that Do you know i i didn't write it down here Oopsie, sorry. I think it's, uh, it's a song of his on Not On Top, I remember. Okay, okay. Um, let's go to... Uh, okay, so I, I have a fill-in-the-blank game. I, there's several songs where you mention a specific number. I notice you have a tendency to be like, put a number into your lyrics, so I want to see if you can remember the, the number, and then I'll also ask sure. if it's true or false. I love um, numbers. <laughs> okay, so... You said in one song, I haven't had a shave in blank weeks. How many weeks was it? 
Ten? It's a lot higher. Fifty-seven? <laughs> Lower. <laughs> Should I just say? Twenty-five. Oh, no. Twenty-five weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. <laughs> well, now it must have been so, so much longer. <laughs> so, is that was that true then when you wrote it that you hadn't had a shave in twenty-five? I mean, it looks like it's probably true. I mean, at this point, I haven't had a shave in uh, in ten years. So, you know, I don't know how many weeks that does, but. Uh, Oh, that's way more than 25. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah, actually, I know how many weeks. It's uh, 520. Because 52 weeks in a year. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so the next one, um, we were going blank on Waterfront Street. How fast were you going on Waterfront Street, David? <laughs> I dare say 90. Was it 65? 65 makes more sense. 90 was that, crazy. Was that true? Well, it's no, it's not true, but uh, um, I'm not a cop. I've always loved knowing that Speedway, you know, <laughs> in uh, Touch of Evil, the Orson Welles movie, Speedway mm. in Venice was the, the street I'm referring to in the song, is the first street where there's ever been a, a real. Uh, car scene, like people driving their car, and he had them driving 60 miles an hour on speedway. Mm. And I've always loved that fact because uh, me and my girlfriend were staying on speedway in Venice, and I knew that that street had been like sped through by Charlton Heston uh, in Touch of Evil, and so I just included that little fact as if it was mine in the in the song, I guess. Cool, cool. Okay, the next one is I saw someone being killed when I was blank. Apparently, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't, well, I would remember the age when I was nine. Fourteen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, true or false? Now, you also don't have to answer. It sounds like if that's true, it's pretty personal. Well, it's it's really true, but I was 16, so I wonder why I put 14, because it rhymes the same. Hmm. Yeah. wonder if I heard 14, but it actually was that you said 16, but I, I'm pretty sure it's you said 14. 14 sounds better. For yeah. Me to okay. And then I think this is the last number one. Uh you said I should have lived blank years ago. Tell me something I don't know. I remember this one because I sang it two days ago. <laughs> a thousand. A thousand? Yeah. What? No, that's not what it is. Isn't it 100? A hundred. A hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it makes more sense. If you were living a thousand years ago. It yeah, what's be, the music uh... like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't make sense. No, it's a hundred. <laughs> I don't know if anyone really wants to go back to the 11th century. That's quite, that's quite a whew. I mean, yeah. it's one thing to go back to before cars and the internet and phones, but to go all the way back to before medicine, woof. Yeah, I oh, don't know. Oh, Maybe oh, the oh, air oh. you breathe would be a little better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that the water tasted better, to be honest with you. Yeah. Okay, so. Beer, huh? I don't know about beer, though. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I've got a few questions that are more personal life questions, I guess. Like, can you talk about your feelings or the role of social media in your life right now? Well, I gave up the phone. Uh, I don't have a phone anymore. I use a device to be on the internet. I don't know. It's a, it's, it's kind of the only outlet there is right now so i like it that way that you know as an artist i just want to i don't even know who's looking but i just want to put it out there what i do is just like uh i've always done it i used to have you know myspace page and all that stuff put mm -hmm. out songs on there but um i don't have much sympathy for uh first the companies that uh, that make the uh the platforms we're on, I don't like them, and I don't like the way they censor whatever we do. 
Right. And um, and then I don't know. I guess if I was successful enough, to be honest, to to not have to be. I mean, not that I have to be, but just to to be able to release a book whenever I have enough drawings to be able to uh, play a show whenever I have a new song, you know, where I might not be on social media at all. I, I think it's just, I just don't like the, um, to have to look at a screen that much, but, um, yeah, it's, but otherwise it's been a great motivation for me to just produce more. I've been doing like these comics every day that I put out there for, you know, not that many people see it, but uh, it's a way to, it's like doing a zine or something. Let's, uh, that's one of my last questions, the comic strips. So since you just brought up the comic strips, do, uh, is there anything you'd like to, can you talk about like the comic strips that you've been making? You're just kind of anything you want people to know or talk about the process? Oh, I do it every day, post it every day. I would recommend, uh, you know, recommend it to anyone who, who wants to read it, I don't know, that just go on Yaya Thon Man uh, on Instagram. I post it every day. There's been like one anthology on paper already and uh, I'm gonna put out a second one. So but it's but you know it's like a daily strip. I love peanuts and all the it's it's just like something a little thought a little thought a day and on Sunday I do a longer one and uh, you know I just it's like a I used to have a diary. It's kind of the same thing, except uh, it takes a lot longer to do the, the drawing. But um, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. So you um, you've got music going. You've got comic strips. You have music videos, mm -hmm. which I have what question one question about to get to. And then also I saw on your Instagram, since we're covering the comic strips and social media, I saw that you have sculptures. Um, yeah. I love sculpting. It's uh, I live in San Pedro, California, and I go to a studio here uh, where I do sculpture. It's really cool. It's very, and I don't know, it flows from, I've always done sculpture a little bit, like more like toy art a little bit. Like I used to do little, little statues, little figurines. But uh, since I go to a real studio where there's space and, uh, and I can do big words in clay and stuff. So I've been doing like uh, much bigger stuff. It's um, nice. Yeah, I love doing it. I paint, I do oil painting and um, sculpture give me a good like 3D um, feeling towards, you know, shading and stuff. So it's good. Okay, I have to ask about the blue puppet in the music videos. Um, I love him as a character quite dearly and how you got into uh, the puppetry aspect in your music videos that we see and the blue guy. It was a guy that I was drawing. I had been drawing for a long time and uh, I had a little, I don't know, it was like kind of my character. You know how some people have their character that they draw it was like the character that I was drawing. And uh, I had a little, I had shows, you know, art shows where I would show like drawings of this guy and all that stuff. And one day I met, the director, Tobin Seymour, who directed all these videos, and he was a puppeteer. And um, so we thought about doing a series of videos with my character as a puppet. It was really fun. I got to, you know, to see a character come to life, which was really interesting because I had been drawing it for a long time. And um, Does he have a name? Yeah, well, the big one, the big one didn't really have a name, but the little one, that, like the son of the big one, was called Baby Blue after the Bob Dylan song because he's blue and he's like a baby. And um, yeah, so that was Baby Blue. There was a toy made of it. And uh, it was really cool. Like for, because between, I guess, 2006 and 2009, like people really got into that character. So there was a toy, there was like a whole brand of clothing with the, from this uh, this brand in France that made like this whole brand. There was a Hawaiian shirt with uh, the motive. I had drawn like, uh, I don't know, like 20 of these little guys and they, they were like prints all over the shirt. They were, all that stuff was cool. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I, lo I love the, I'm so glad you brought him to life because he, he gives me so much joy just to like 
whenever I watch the videos and like hang out with him for those seconds of, you know, me engaging with your video art, it's just, it's really nice. Great. Um, <laughs> and then I want to ask about your vegetarian slash vegan diet. Um, if you could talk about that for a second. Yeah, pleasure. Well, at this point, I've been a vegetarian longer than I have not been. Uh, it's been now uh, 24 years, and uh, I'm still still breathing. You know, some people get uh, freaked out. They think they're going to die if they, <laughs> they go vegan, but um, I can assure you, you don't. And, uh, and I, I'll even add that I didn't start off as a health freak. Like, I didn't know anything about nutrients or anything. I was just like, I had, um, I loved animals. I just didn't want to kill or eat animals. So that's how I started. And basically I survived on French fries and, uh, and ketchup for, for a few years. And uh, now that I live in California and can, you know, have good produce and stuff, I eat more, you know, healthier way, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, I'm really happy to be a vegetarian, a vegan. But to quote Leonard Cohen, I can pet my cat and feel a lot better about it, you know, knowing that I haven't eaten other animals. And was, was Leonard was, was Leonard a vegan? He was at the time, and until recently, I think. Although I, I recently read his last poetry book, and uh, there's a few by the end that mention meat, so I don't know. But he was in the 60s. And I know that even in his old age in uh, Los Angeles, he used to go to Fat Burger for a veggie burger. So, but I don't know for sure. And um, is there any chance that you follow uh, Anthony Fantano? He's a very popular vegan uh, on, he's a music um, journalist as well. And he's actually part of why I felt like prepared to go ahead and try to do an interview even though i had it because he just sort of started on his own as well and he's a vegan as well what's his handle at andy fontana um at the needle drop if it's twitter if it's instagram it's at a fantano yeah okay. he's vegan Would you send it to me afterwards I yeah absolutely absolutely i've been following i don't know it's like the food culture is so uh has become such a part of uh I've been following, like, you know, people who take pictures of good, <laughs> good, good food. I don't know. It's, it's like funny. It's know. kind of nice, isn't it? I've been trying to eat a lot more vegetables lately and like uh, vegan meals here and there as well. And it, it always feels better when I'm eating that way. So That's I'm good. trying. Yeah. I've always loved, you know, uh, being able to prove myself that uh, I don't need this or that. And it's always been a good experience, you know. Recently, right. me, and, me and my girlfriend have been going uh, raw, raw food for uh, for like two weeks or something. And at first, you're like craving fried food and stuff. And uh, after a while, it's just your body is just like is not digesting all the time, and you just feel totally free. It's, it's just this kind. Of, anytime you can prove yourself that you can get rid of a habit. You always feel better mentally and physically, I feel. Heck yeah. Okay, so we're almost to the hour point. I really appreciate you really? spending all this time. Yeah. Okay. And I just had like two last questions to kind of round out. Um, like I want you to, I want to ask you about what you're working on now. And, uh, and then if you want to touch on like your goals going into the future for yourself as an artist, as a musician, as a sculptor, as a comic book writer, as a okay. everything. I can do the round. I'm working on, right now I'm working on, you know, I'm writing a new album on piano that I wish to record in the, the next month or so. So I have um, a bunch of new songs that all written on my piano. I've been working on sculptures, let's see. Here's, Ula, can you see? Let me see. Here's a little um, head of Charles Bukowski that I've done recently. Oh, this nice. is uh, Richard Brodigan, um, Alfred Hitchcock, you know, Ooh. some of the Californian masters that have been uh, 
making sculptures of. I can show you my comic book that I'm working on every day. So I do it here in this little book, and there's all these drawings. Can you see? Yes, I love it. I love that you're showing. Yes. Okay. Oh. So I've been working on that. What else? Well, let me show you. I play bass every day. Ooh. Here, been working on my bass skills. Um, what else? I've been making planters. Ooh. Yes. Show me the plants. Oh, I saw that picture on your uh, your Instagram the other day of the hat with the plant in it. Yes, yeah, so I'm making hats. Oh my gosh, looks uh, mad. Looks like a great day today. Yeah, summer, uh, spring is kicking in. It's pretty good. I just I felt like, um, like if you wanted to like play a little ditty since the piano's right there, you you might as well if you want to. You don't have to. No pressure. Sure. I'll do it. You should. Okay. Yay! Can you see me? Yes. I feel a little strange. Like, I've tried not to fangirl out on you for, like, the last hour, but that was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'll send Hope you, you that get a link lot of to other interviews and um, enjoy your YouTube channel or whatever. Or what's it called when we're doing the Instagram um, channel? Instagram, yeah, baby chicken at Instagram, baby chicken on YouTube. I'm going to be, honestly, um, I'm trying to do an interview with Jeffrey soon. He's got a show coming up in Cincinnati. Um, pretty sure that's going to happen, too. I still need to schedule it. But, yeah, the, you're my first, and I'm just, like, so happy. Thank you so much. Of course. Okay, I'll send you the link to the Anthony Vegan Fantano dude, and have a great day, okay? Have a good day. Bye. Bye.